Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? At this point, retro gaming is pretty well known in popular culture, but despite our constant appetite for the latest and greatest technology, there's one up and coming phenomenon that I find really interesting. Let's talk about retro computing. You know, the nostalgia angle, I think, is is going to be becoming more and more commonplace as time goes on and as we kind of culturally and collectively maybe reminisce or, or rediscover a lot of aspects of our, our youth or adolescence um, that maybe we've lost sight of, you know, in the intervening years. Obviously, retro gaming. A, a big focus nowadays. There are industries built around retro gaming. I mean, companies uh, that exist that that without retro gaming, they just wouldn't have a reason for being. And there are even some other phenomena as well. Um, I've done a recent podcast episode about kind of the, the resurgence of vinyl records, you know, listening to music. Um, as much as we've swung towards music as being this commodity thing, it's, it's also kind of, you know, diversified in a way back into the physical realm. And I think the next big frontier, and I've seen quite a bit of buildup in this, is the concept of retro computing. Now, by no means is anyone getting into retro computing and expecting it to be you know, their, their main daily driver, their battle station. I mean, nobody's going out and, and being like, you know, screw buying a brand new MacBook or a brand new Chromebook or, you know, Microsoft Surface or whatever. I don't want the latest and greatest. I'm going to go, you know, out and buy like, you know, a laptop that's 15 years old because I think they were built better. No one is doing that for their daily driver. This is purely meant just for enjoyment and entertainment and, you know, being able to reminisce. Um, it, it, I think, maybe serves a different purpose than what retro gaming can. But in some ways, while it's a lot like retro gaming from kind of a, a maybe philosophical or psychological standpoint, in that you're still getting that fulfillment of, you know, hey, I remember this from 15, 20 or more years ago, and you're getting back into it again, it's also, in some ways, a very different beast. So let me explain. With retro gaming, you've got kind of a known quantity. You know, there, there were only so many console models made. There were only so many games for each console. You know, it's, it's kind of like you're playing with Legos. You know, only certain pieces are going to fit together. There are only certain, you know, blocks of each shape and size and color. and only so many combinations, you know, and because a lot of gaming and even today, a lot of gaming just in general has been very cookie cutter. It's, it's more of a collecting kind of an aspect, you know, with retro gaming. Yes, plenty of people play retro gaming. They don't just collect for the sake of collecting. A lot of them actually want to play those games and, and remember what it was like, or, you know, discover something that they never had. But there's, there's kind of, you know, all these known permutations, you know, anyone who says, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a Sega Genesis collector, you know, I, I had when I was a kid and I lost it and now I bought another one, I'm getting back into these games. It's really easy to have many points of reference when talking with that person because, you know, there are only so many games and there's a very good chance that, um, that you know, you've got some in common that you're familiar with and all that. With retro computing, it's very different. Even back in the 80s, computing was such, had become such a broad topic, and it's just, it's just pervasive in society now. You know, so there was this major buildup over time, where it's not so much, uh, hey, I had you know this thing, and I had this thing, and I this thing, and you'll find somebody else who had that exact same combination and you know you can you can talk at length about the intricacies it's a lot of you know oh did you have this part yeah I had this part but I had it in this other computer you know um, 
you know, it, it, there, how do I word it? There were, there were more, there were more Lego pieces in the bucket, I guess is the easiest way to think about it. So there's a lot more exploration going on with people getting into retro computing. I guess is maybe the easiest way to think of it. It's it's not so much, you know, when you get into retro computing, it's not like deciding that you want to get into the Super NES, so then you go and you look up what were the most popular Super NES games back in the day, or, you know, maybe what were the highest rated ones, and so you hit eBay or local stores or whatever, and you find those and buy them and take them home. With retro computing, the base is so broad that you can go in very many different directions and never, I would say never really even fully explore the concept that is retro computing. I mean, it's possible to buy a complete collection of every game for a certain platform. And if you had enough time and especially money, it, it is possible to buy every major console platform and every game for it. You know, you could build your own complete video game museum with enough time and money. That's not really possible with retro computing. So you go into it as more of an exploration instead of as just a collecting exercise, I guess. You, you know, you figure out what era, you know, you start maybe with what era, what, you know, what time period what kind of computer do you want to get into? Do you want something that's um, going to be predominantly command line based? You're looking at something like, you know, maybe the old Apple II series or something that ran DOS. Um, you know, maybe a really old, you know, Unix kind of system, um, you know, from maybe early to mid 80s. Or do you want to get into something that's more GUI based? You know, do you want to get something a little bit fresher, maybe get into the Macintosh? Windows 3.1, dare I say OS 2, um, you know, kind of era, and explore what was going on then. Of course, then that opens up selection for hardware. Um, you know, what, what class of hardware do you want to get into? Do you want to get into desktops? Do you want to get into, like, you know, high-power workstations, um, the early laptops, that sort of thing. And so, in some ways, Retro computing can be, I think, more exciting than retro gaming, at least in that you've got a bit more of that whole kid playing in the sandbox kind of mentality, you know? It's not just, well, I'm going to go hit up eBay and, you know, buy these copies of these games for the system I'm collecting for. It's more doing the research, trying to figure out, okay, so I'm targeting this era what was, you know, an interesting system to buy? What operating system did it run? What were some of the peripherals and accessories and expansion cards and whatnot that people had back in the day? What, what kind of predominant use do I want to have for that system? You know, do I want to build the, the kind of computer that somebody maybe had at home for home use, you know, say back in the 80s or the 90s? Or like what someone would use at a business? And if it was at a business, what type of business was it? You know, computers, it, it, it took a while for computers to get to the point where people cannot do their jobs without a computer. And especially, and it still kind of boggles my mind even now, that there are jobs that the purpose is not to use a computer. You know, like accountants, their job is to not use a computer. If you work in IT, your job is to use a computer, right? Without a computer, you cannot do your job. With, uh, you know, a job like accounting or something like that, it's a more abstract concept. You would think, you know, the job is not to use a computer. It's to figure out the financial things with the moving money around and all the stuff that accountants do. But even all of these other, the, these other disciplines rely on computers now. And that's something that you also think about when you're looking at retro computing is, you know, even back in the 90s, there were some disciplines that really got to the point where they were starting to rely on computers. And so there's some fascinating angles going on there, watching that evolution, you know, playing around with the early spreadsheet software, see what it could do, what it couldn't do. 
you know, obviously as computers evolve, they're going to try and tackle the tasks that people needed done most. Not necessarily go for like the whiz bang, real show off features, at least from, you know, a business perspective, it's gonna be more along the lines of, you know, hey, how can we improve productivity? What are the most tedious things that people have to do by hand, not using a computer? Can we get a computer to make that easier? So you've got just tons and tons of these different angles to go from when, when you're collecting for retro computing. And it doesn't, I, I, I keep using the word collecting for retro computing, but it doesn't even need to be a collection. Um, you don't need to get a whole ton of stuff. You can just pick one system and try to, you know, build it up, max it out. Um, and to some extent, retro computing has parallels with retro gaming in that to get into it, in a lot of cases, you don't even really need to buy the hardware. You know, with retro computing, or retro gaming, I should say, if you want to play this one obscure video game title that's super expensive on eBay and very hard to find and all that, well, you know, you've got emulation. We're seeing a lot of options for that with retro computing as well. Um, you know, newer operating systems that run on, say, Intel processors, you can generally get going in virtualization pretty easily. But there are emulators for other CPU platforms as well. In fact, when I did a previous podcast episode where I was talking about my favorite computer game, I was playing SimCity 2000 in the classic Mac OS. I was doing all of that in an emulator, simply because it was easiest to do screen capture from. I do have actual hardware at home that can play those games. But, you know, even, even dissimilar hardware you know, the computers today are powerful enough that we can emulate that. So, you know, it's, it's just more of the mental kind of relearning or learning what you didn't know back then um, or remembering that's involved in retro computing and not so much getting into, you know, a gaming platform and buying these games for the end purpose of just playing the games. No doubt people enjoy the act of collecting retro games. I mean, it's kind of the thrill of the hunt and the satisfaction of, you know, I've got a complete collection of this or, you know, or I've got this rare whatever, that sort of thing. That's certainly fun, but I would say that probably most people, not all, but most people who get into retro gaming, the end goal is simply to be able to play those games on original hardware, you know, to relive that experience. With retro computing, I think it would be fair to say that in some ways it's a little bit more along the lines of the journey is the reward. You know, there isn't necessarily an end goal with retro computing in mind. You know, you don't set out to try and build a system just so you can sit there and and you know, do, do your finances in a 20 year old version of Excel. I, I'm sure some people get a kick out of that, but I would think, and at least my own experience with retro computing kind of suggests that it's more fun to just kind of noodle about with it, you know, and, and figure out what its place was in history. And and look at how people used it back then. Uh, these old computers, they're, they're almost like time capsules in a way. More so, I think, than retro gaming. I mean, retro gaming kind of showed us, you know, maybe what gaming culture was in that era. But because computers were starting to, to cut across all these different aspects of our lives and we started to see people using them at home and at work and at school and in industry, that maybe computing is a better cross-section of society. Um, you know, there's, there's almost like kind of an anthropology angle to it maybe. And I, I do find interesting the parallels between what's become popular, you know, what's getting popular in retro computing and what's become and getting popular in retro gaming. They actually seem to follow kind of the same pattern. 
I talked about this a long time ago, and it's the, the concept of the pricing curve for retro gaming, where, or for any gaming really, where, you know, when, when gaming is brand new, it's, you know, quote unquote expensive, you know, so you go out and buy a brand new game right now, say for the PlayStation 4, the Xbox One, it's gonna cost you like 60 bucks US. And then in a couple of years, that price is gonna come down. And a couple of years after that, maybe that's no longer the current platform. It's a generation old, maybe two generations old. You're not finding copies of that game brand new anymore, but you're finding them, you know, at used game stores for really cheap. Um, as I'm filming this right now, PlayStation and PlayStation 2 games are still fairly cheap. I think they're starting to creep up in value, but it wasn't too long ago when you could go and find PS2 games for like five, 10 bucks. And the same thing with the hardware. And then as time goes on, people start getting kind of, you know, nostalgic about all of that and the price curves back up again. And that's where we're seeing some of the levels we are now with the NES and the Super NES and the Genesis and all that, you know, where, where copies of some games go for hundreds of dollars where, you know, maybe even just six or seven years ago, they were like 10, 15 bucks. That's, that's driven on the time kind of cycle, you know, people reaching a certain age, they become nostalgic about what was new and fresh when they were young and they have a desire for that again. I'm seeing the same thing with retro computing. Um, you know, starting, starting maybe four years or so ago, maybe a little longer, um, in some of the circles that I follow, I saw a big resurgence in the Apple One, like the very original, very first computer Apple ever made. They didn't make very many of them. Um, and many of them actually got destroyed. So the ones that are still out there are incredibly rare and they literally go for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Obviously that's not something that people can reasonably attain. But starting a few years ago, there was this big community of, you know, electronics engineers and people who are very, very knowledgeable going and actually making reproductions of these. These computers were generally so simple that they could easily be reverse engineered and people went out and they produced circuit boards and kits that you could assemble on your own to build another one of these. And now we're starting to see that kind of work into the Apple IIs. Granted the Apple II series, the Apple II, Apple II Plus, IIe, so forth, you know, they were, they were produced at much larger volume than the Apple I, so you can still go out and actually buy one of those used, but prices are going up on those. It wasn't too long ago when you couldn't really give some of that stuff away. It was all getting sent off to e-waste for recycling. But now it's very interesting in that it's got some value. You know, Apple II, really good early model Apple II systems can go for hundreds of dollars, if not more. And so that cycle kind of continues, you know, older stuff becomes popular again, the value goes up as people reach a certain age and become nostalgic about it. I think the next thing that's gonna start, you know, coming back into favor is gonna be older, you know, PC stuff. Um, stuff that ran DOS, maybe getting into Windows 3.1 and the parallel is gonna be some of the old Mac stuff. We're already seeing prices on older Mac stuff rise. Um, I remember 15 years ago seeing Computers like, you know, old Macs from that era just getting thrown out, you know, the old, like the late 80s, early 90s stuff just get thrown out. Now it's going for hundreds, if not thousands, if they're particularly rare. Um, a video that I just did recently, kind of a retrospective, which you, if you haven't checked that out, you should, on the Mac Color Classic, a fairly rare machine. I bought mine 20-ish years ago for about a hundred bucks. And that was a partially inflated price just because the machine was, you know, rare back then. Now they're going for hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. Um, it, it all goes kind of in circles. But what's really interesting is it's not just this cut and dried, okay, you own it. Now you're done, you play it. It's where do you take it from there? You know, I own a Mac Color Classic, but that's not the end of the story. Some people use 
color classics at home. Some people use them at school. And actually a lot of the comments on that particular video were people saying, oh, hey, I remember we had these in school or this was the first computer we ever had at home or something like, you know, I had one of these in college, something like that. So you can then kind of branch out and explore, you know, what if you had one of these at school, what were some of the common peripherals? Something I didn't get into in that video, I kind of cut for time, I didn't want it to get too long, but in schools, one thing that that particular machine, the Mac Color Classic, was targeted towards was learning software, of course, but Apple came out with a card that allowed the Color Classic to play Apple II games. And that was one of the predominant reasons why Apple built an expansion card slot into that computer, which is something they typically didn't do on those all-in-one compact machines. So, you know, I guess not to belabor the point, but retro computing, I'd like to say, is a, much, a lot more open-ended maybe than retro gaming. Um, and of course, there's these cottage industries popping up that are starting to produce new things for retro computing. Um, you know, as physical media kind of fails, floppy drives start to get temperamental and you are having difficulty locating disks and transferring software from modern computers to older ones, that sort of thing. We're starting to see, you know, products come up that allow you to, you know, more directly connect, say, an SD card or a USB flash drive or something to transfer software directly to an old computer. Um, just like we're seeing in retro gaming, things like flashcards, where you can load ROMs onto a flashcard and play them on original hardware. So there are some very interesting parallels there, yet there are some big differences, I think. And retro computing, I think, has quite a ways to go. Um, I don't think by any means is it going to be a short-term fad, just like we've seen with retro gaming. Retro gaming is not a fad. It's very much here to stay. It'll be really, really interesting to see where things go with retro computing. So with that, I'm curious, are you into that scene? Do you have any retro computers at home? Uh, what are you into collecting if you, if you are into it? Um, any particular you know, genres or niches that, that you're looking towards or is it just you wanna get your hands on anything and everything you can? so you can kind of learn and experience all of that again. So be sure to shout that out down in the comments below. Of course, I'm also always soliciting feedback suggestions for future topics. So if you've got one, be sure to hit me up with that. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcom. And as always, thanks for watching.